I am Dr. Rep, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare, Series 2, Podcast N, Antony and Cleopatra. Antony and Cleopatra is the last and most mature of Shakespeare's three plays named for pairs of lovers. The conflict in the early romantic tragedy Romeo and Juliet is between love and death, youthful impetuosity, meeting a star-crossed fate in the form of a feud between families. As we will see later, in Series 2 podcast U, in the satire Troilus and Cressida, both love and death are trivialized by the corruption of heroic ideals. In Antony and Cleopatra, Shakespeare expands the tragedy of love and death to the world historical stage in a supreme example of the incarnational style discussed in the section on universal realism in Session 3 of Chapter 1 in Series 1. That capacity to dramatize both realistic particulars and universal generalities in one set of words, characters, and actions, and thereby in one single experience of meaning. The conflict between universal opposites dramatized in Antony and Cleopatra may be characterized in any number of ways, as West versus East, Mind versus Nature, Reason versus Passion, Duty versus Self-Indulgence, Conquest versus Suicide, and Order versus Chaos. But the drama is played out in a pageant of the lives of real historical figures, Shakespeare's Octavius Caesar is the particular figure we know from history, even as he embodies, in himself and in his career, the first of each of the pairs of abstractions I just listed. Rome and the rational mind, and duty, and the order of the West, which grow in effective power until Octavius, consolidating the conquests of Julius Caesar, subdues the known world to his government. Similarly, Cleopatra is the historical seductress we know from history, even as she embodies the second of the pairs of abstractions, Egypt and the passion and self-indulgence and mystical impracticality of the East, which are governed by feeling and mere nature and are represented by the life-giving Nile River and its death-dealing serpents. Antony is the historical Antony brought to life even as he embodies the conflict between these two opposite worlds and worldviews, between which he vacillates. Octavius conquers the practical world of fact, but he cannot govern the extreme passion that draws Antony to Cleopatra. That world-dividing passion, culminating in the suicides of the lovers, conquers the human imagination mythically. Their names title the play, but it cannot survive in the world in the face of Caesar's practicality. The tragedy lies in the irreconcilable conflict between the two worlds, Rome, reason, duty, and Egypt, passion, self-indulgence, embodied in the lives of the characters. Under Shakespeare's masterful hand, we experience as a single thing the conflict between Caesar's historic destiny and the particular world-conquering passion of Antony and Cleopatra. To this conflict, Shakespeare gives a local habitation and a name, as Theseus calls it in A Midsummer Night's Dream, Act 5, Scene 1, Line 17, thereby making it both universally significant and thoroughly and believably personal. The only early text of Antony and Cleopatra is in the first folio. The plot is based mainly on the life of Marcus Antonius in Thomas North's English translation, 1579, of Jacques Amiot's French translation, 1559, of Plutarch's Parallel Lives of the Greeks and Romans. The play was written in about 1606 to 1607, probably after Macbeth and before Coriolanus. The language of the play is rich and intense and mostly clear. There are few significant cruxes. The first half of the play scintillates with wit and cleverness, not least in the inventiveness of Cleopatra in winding her toils around the heartstrings of Antony, 
who finds, as he says in Act 1, Scene 1, at lines 49 to 50, that everything becomes her, to chide, to laugh, to weep. She begs him to tell her how much he loves her, line 14. She sarcastically tells him to obey the commands to leave her that she imagines coming from Antony's wife Fulvia and his co-triumvir Caesar, lines 20 to 32. She calls him a liar while wanting his words to be true, line 40, and Act 1, Scene 3, line 39. She refuses to look upon him, Act 1, Scene 2, line 87. To Charmian, she says, in Act 1, Scene 3, lines 2 to 5, See where he is, who's with him, what he does. I did not send you. If you find him sad, say I am dancing. If in mirth, report that I am sudden sick. When he appears a few lines later, she pretends to be dying, lines 13 to 17. Then she pretends to chase him away, line 33. Then, cut my lace, Charmian, to relieve her bursting heart, followed immediately by, let it be, I am quickly ill and well. So, meaning so long as, Antony loves, line 71 to 73. When Antony threatens really to lose his temper with her, she says, Forgive me, since my becomings kill me when they do not I will to you. Lines 95 to 97. When Charmian says that Cleopatra would do better to cross him in nothing, Cleopatra replies, Thou teachest like a fool the way to lose him. Lines 9 to 10. These wildly inventive vacillations in Cleopatra take on tragic proportions when she causes her fleet to turn tail and flee the sea battle in Act 3, Scene 10, and later when, to avoid his wrath, she sends word to Antony that she is dead in Act 4, Scenes 13 and 14. Another fount of wit is the plain-speaking Enobarbus. About the death of Antony's troublesome wife Fulvia, he says, at Act 1, Scene 2, lines 169 to 170, the tears live in an onion that should water this sorrow. He engages in sallies of wit with Antony in lines 153 to 154 in an attempt both to affirm the wonderful piece of work, meaning masterpiece, that is Cleopatra, and through satire to cause Antony to get some distance from her. About Cleopatra's likely response to news that Antony must leave her, he says at lines 140 to 144, Cleopatra, catching but the least noise of this, dies instantly. I have seen her die twenty times upon far poorer moment. I do think there is metal in death which commits some loving act upon her. She hath such celerity in dying. To this, Antony responds at line 145 with a phrase that takes on mythic significance. She is cunning past man's thought whereupon Enobarbus ironically confirms by pretending to deny her cunning. The figure of speech is called apophysis. Alack, no, sir, her passions are made of nothing but the finest part of pure love. We cannot call her winds and waters, sighs and tears. They are greater storms and tempests than almanacs can report. This cannot be cunning in her. If it be, she makes a shower of rain as well as Jove. Yet for all his satire, Cleopatra continues to cultivate her celerity in dying through the play until she dies indeed. And for all his awareness of her cunning, Antony cannot avoid being ruined by loving her. The inventive language seen in the wit of the early acts rises into language of mythic grandeur as the lovers approach their deaths and Caesar his triumph. Here are some examples. In Act 4, Scene 3, Line 16 to 17, a soldier says about strange music heard under the earth, "'Tis the god Hercules, whom Antony loved, now leaves him." In Act 4, Scene 14, Lines 35 to 36 and 57 to 62, Antony says, "'Unarm, Eros, the long day's task is done, and we must sleep. And I that with my sword quartered the world, and o'er green Neptune's back with ships made cities, 
condemn myself to lack the courage of a woman, less noble mind than she which, by her death, our Caesar tells, I am conqueror of myself. At Act 5, Scene 1, lines 37 to 48, Caesar says about Antony, I must perforce have shown to thee such a declining day, or look on thine. We could not stall together in the whole world. But yet let me lament that thou, my brother, my competitor in top of all design, my mate in empire, friend and companion in the front of war, the arm of mine own body, and the heart where mine his thoughts did kindle, that our stars, unreconcilable, should divide our equalness to this. At Act 4, Scene 15, Lines 66 to 68, and Act 5, Scene 2, Lines 79 to 92, Cleopatra says about Antony, The odds is gone, and there is nothing left remarkable beneath the visiting moon. And his face was as the heavens, and therein stuck a sun and moon which kept their course and lighted the little O, the earth. His legs bestrid the ocean, his reared arm crested the world. For his bounty there was no winter in it. His delights were dolphin-like. They showed his back above the element they lived in. In his livery walked crowns and crownets. Realms and islands were as plates dropped from his pocket. At Act 4, Scene 15, Lines 86-88, to 88, and Act 5, Scene 2, Lines 238-241, to 241, and 280-281, to 281, Cleopatra says, What's brave, what's noble, let's do it after the high Roman fashion, and make death proud to take us. And, my resolutions placed, I have nothing of woman in me. Now from head to foot I am marble constant. Now the fleeting moon no planet is of mine. And, give me my robe, put on my crown, I have immortal longings in me. All of this heightened language, calling upon the vast geography of the universe to exalt the lovers and their conqueror, raises the famous story itself to the level of universal myth. It is precisely the opposite movement from that of Troilus and Cressida, in which all the famous heroism is disintegrated amidst worldly decay. Here, all worldliness, conquest of war, and passion of love is raised by the language to the extremest pitch of world historical importance. The mythologizing language is counterbalanced by the character of Enobarbus, who is entirely Shakespeare's invention. Plutarch gives us the name of Enobarbus, but not his character. In the role of Enobarbus, Shakespeare puts the world historical story into perspective. The first thing to say about Enobarbus is that he is a plain speaker, a type on the Elizabethan stage, like the character that Kent in King Lear pretends to be when he goes into disguise. Enobarbus speaks truth as he sees it. At Act 2, Scene 6, Lines 78 to 79, Pompey says of Enobarbus, Enjoy thy plainness, it nothing ill becomes thee. He can speak in exalted language, too, especially in his justly famous description of Cleopatra at Act 2, Scene 2, lines 191 to 239. But he also serves as a counterweight to the exaggerated glorifications of both Antony and Cleopatra. That is, until he condemns himself for betraying them at Act 4, Scene 6, lines 29 to 38. Because of his plain speaking, to others, and more importantly to himself, Enobarbus serves as a trustworthy commentator. He is obviously moved by Cleopatra's charms, as an observer, though not a lover, but he also can see her manipulations, and from the Roman viewpoint, her follies. He is a perfect servant for Antony, because he both has Roman values and can see why Antony won't leave Cleopatra despite her abuses of him in his efforts to remain a Roman. The double reverse of Enobarbus at the end, 
leaving Antony and then repenting for having done so, is a reflection of Antony's own wavering between Roman thoughts and the serpent of old Nile. At Act 3, scene 13, lines 3 to 8, Enobarbus has blamed Antony for the disaster at sea because he would make his will, that is, his sexual passion for Cleopatra, lord of his reason, and follow the itch of his affection, which nicked his captainship. Nicked, a term from the dice game called hazard, means cut into, or got the better of. Because of Antony's conflict between Rome and Egypt, Enobarbus is at war with himself. Mine honesty and I begin to square, meaning face off against one another. The loyalty well held to fools does make our faith mere folly. Yet he that can endure to follow with allegiance a fallen lord does conquer him that did his master conquer and earns a place in the story. Lines 41 to 46. Despite his Roman loyalty, a few lines later, hearing Cleopatra temporize with Caesar's messenger, Enobarbus says, aside as if to Antony, Sir, sir, thou art so leaky that we must leave thee to thy sinking, for thy dearest quit thee. Lines 63 to 65. By the end of the scene, seeing Antony fantasizing about valorously winning a losing battle, Enobarbus observes about Antony, Now he'll outstare the lightning. To be furious is to be frighted out of fear, and in that mood the dove will peck the estridge. That's a kind of hawk. And I see still, meaning always, a diminution in our captain's brain restores his heart. When valor preys on reason, it eats the sword it fights with. I will seek some way to leave him. Lines 194 to 200. Those eight monosyllables, I will seek some way to leave him, are fiercely telling. Enobarbus does abandon Antony, but when a soldier tells Enobarbus at Act 4, Scene 6, lines 19 to 21, that Antony hath after thee sent all thy treasure with his bounty overplus, Enobarbus cannot bear his own betrayal of Antony's nobility. I am alone the villain of the earth, and feel I am so most. O oh, Antony, thou mine of bounty, how wouldst thou have paid my better service when my turpitude thou dost so crown with gold? This blows my heart, meaning swells it to bursting. If swift thought break it not, a swifter mean shall outstrike thought, but thought will do it, I feel. Lines 29 to 35. He is right. Conflicted thought itself does it. In Act 4, Scene 9, Line 23, he dies without having to kill himself, crying, O oh, Antony! Thus, the conflict between Rome and Egypt, Caesar and Cleopatra, mind and heart, is incarnated not only in Antony, but also in Enobarbus. As a former colleague of mine has said, the death of Enobarbus is utterly un-Roman. Simply, he dies of a broken heart. But there is a marvelous Shakespearean reason for it. He dies of a combination of shame and love, that is, of having shamed his love of Antony's nobility. It is one more example of how the this-worldliness in the play is suffused by an almost transcendently metaphysical commitment to passion, the heart, love, as if the universe were trying to give birth to a revelation of the super-reality and preeminent value of love above all else, and could not yet quite do so. Not only in Abarbus, but Iris too dies of no physical wound, but simply of a broken heart. Eros dies of love because he would rather die than see Antony die. Charmian does the same in relation to Cleopatra. Everybody is literally dying of love, except Caesar. But Caesar must not, because it is his destiny, though he esteems the lovers and their deaths, to unite and pacify the Roman Empire, 
whose own destiny, as Shakespeare and his audience believed, was to become the seat of the world religion arising from the birth, in a manger in Roman Judea, of a greater and redeeming doctrine of love. The play is not explicitly Christian, but it seems to be Shakespeare's effort to make the greatest lovers of the ancient historical world into a pageant of the furthest that natural man can imagine going in giving up the world for love. Cleopatra is in love with Antony, but even more in love with his and others' love for her. As the poet Philip Thompson writes, the irresistible magic of Shakespeare's Cleopatra lies in her self-centered but universal erotic vision, in her poetic imagination that makes erotic myth of all experience. She has her own vision of the love that moves the sun and the other stars. That's the last line of Dante's Divine Comedy. It is desire for her. Antony is divided and rushes back and forth between Rome and Egypt, between duty to Rome and love for Cleopatra. Enobarba sees both and at first thinks this radical love is madness, then he feels it is better to succumb to that madness than to betray it for Caesar, then he betrays it, and then repents for betraying it. Caesar himself must defeat Antony because, to establish and embody Rome, he must resist the disorderly valuing of passion of those who betray him, the dissolving of order in the waters of the Nile. But even in his conquest, at Act 5, Scene 1, Line 40, Caesar says, Yet let me lament the passionate Antony, whom the fates have decreed he must defeat. In Act 4, Scene 3, Line 16 to 17, the god Hercules, that is, the spirit of triumph in battle, whom Antony loved, mystically leaves him before Antony's last battles. But the language of Antony's death, like that of the deaths of Cleopatra, Enobarbus, Iris, and Charmian, and even the pronouncement of Caesar upon them, proclaimed the longing for a world in which love is realer than death. Shakespeare's audience believed that they knew what the Romans did not, how that longing could be fulfilled. The play powerfully presents an image of how such a fulfillment might look, though in a pagan way misread, in the lives and deaths of lovers, including Enobarbus, who had not the benefit of revelation, but only their own transcendence-hungry passion to lead them. Caesar, speaking in Act 4, Scene 6, Lines 4 to 6, about the Pax Romana to come, must have been heard by Shakespeare's audience to be speaking unwittingly of the birth of Christianity. The time of universal peace is near. Prove this a prosperous day, the three-nooked world shall bear the olive freely. Three-nooked refers to the three realms, namely Asia, Africa, and Europe, into which, after the great flood, God had parceled the world to the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The story is in Genesis chapter 9, verse 19, and chapter 10, verses 1 through 32. All three nooks come under the rule of Rome, and the olive they bear symbolizes peace. However much or little Shakespeare expected to call to the mind of his audience the Christianity that would resolve the paradoxes between reason and passion, or East and West, the story itself unites those paradoxical opposites in our experience of the play. In the concluding lines of the play, Act 5, Scene 2, lines 359 to 363, Caesar echoes Enobarbus at Act 3, Scene 13, line 46, in referring to the story itself, in which he has not only a place, like Enobarbus, but the preeminent place. No grave upon the earth shall clip in it a pair so famous. High events as these strike those that make them, and their story is no less in pity than his glory which brought them to be lamented. That is, the story of these lovers is as full of pity for them as of glory for their conqueror, meaning Octavius himself. 
Here, Caesar sums up the contrasting forces that the story has united. Not only Rome and Egypt, West and East, reason and passion, but here, in its ending, glory and pity. In doing so, he goes as far as Shakespeare believed the Roman imagination could go in uniting the world historical opposites. At war in the world, they are united in the story. But Shakespeare has gone further than his character in the uniting of apparently paradoxical opposites. By his own preeminent art, he has united the general to the particular, incarnating universal meaning in the particulars of the story and its characters. Only the story to be told at Jerusalem, as Shakespeare believed, and as this play hints, could unite such opposites in ultimate reality, and that story was to be crafted by the only hands greater than Shakespeare's at the art of incarnation. Now here are five key lines of the play. Key line one. Compare how messengers with bad news are treated by the rational Romans and by the passionate Cleopatra. Antony says, Who tells me true, though in his tale lie death, I hear him as, meaning as if, he flattered. Act 1, Scene 2, lines 98 to 99. Caesar responds to a message of bad news, I should have known no less. Act 1, Scene 4, line 40. Pompey says, I could have given less matter, meaning less significant news, a better ear. Act 2, Scene 1, lines 31 to 32. By contrast, when Cleopatra hears news she does not like, she says to the messenger, The most infectious pestilence upon thee. Act 2, Scene 5, line 61. And then, the stage direction tells us, strikes him down. She adds, Though it be honest, it is never good to bring bad news. Line 85 to 86. And then she dismisses the messenger with no tip, but only his own bad news for reward. Lines 103 to 106. In this difference in the treatment of messengers, we see the difference between the virtue of Rome and the passion of Egypt. Key line two. The whole conflict of the play is pictured in little in several lines from Act Two. Mecenas says, at scene two, lines 232 to 233, Now Antony must leave Cleopatra utterly. Enobarbus replies, Never, he will not. Age cannot wither her, nor custom stale her infinite variety. Lines 233 to 235. Mecenas says, If beauty, wisdom, modesty can settle the heart of Antony, Octavia is a blessed lottery to him. Lines 240 to 242. The contrast between Cleopatra and Octavia is here explicit. Egyptian seductiveness versus Roman virtue. Octavia, Caesar's sister, is the bait to lure Antony back to Rome and to peace with Octavius. But in the next scene, Act 2, Scene 3, Antony asks the soothsayer, Whose fortunes shall rise higher, Caesar's or mine? Lines 16 to 17. The soothsayer says, after two and a half empty feet for effect, Caesar's. Thy demon, D-A-E-M-O-N, that thy spirit which keeps thee, is noble, courageous, high, unmatchable, where Caesar's is not. But near him, thy angel becomes a fear, as being overpowered. Therefore, make space enough between you. Thy spirit is all afraid to govern thee near him. But away, tis noble. Lines 20 to 31. At lines 34 to 36, Antony himself confirms the soothsayer's words. He hath spoken true. The very dice obey him, meaning Caesar. And in our sports, my better cunning faints under his chance, meaning luck. Then Antony concludes, at line 39 to 41, I will to Egypt, and though I make this marriage, that is to Octavia, for my peace, in the east my pleasure lies. Cleopatra, being the queen of Egypt, is often called Egypt. 
by Antony, by Iris, by Caesar, in keeping with the Elizabethan notion of the two bodies of the king, which I discussed in session two of chapter seven in series one. Here, when he says, I will to Egypt, Antony means both the land of Egypt and its queen. In the world of this play, Rome and Egypt are irreconcilable. From Shakespeare's point of view, the historical world had to wait for a higher power to incarnate the ultimate reconciliation between mind and heart. Key line three. There is a brief but telling antithesis in the speech of Minas at Act 2, Scene 6, lines 118 to 119. I think the policy of that purpose made more in the marriage than the love of the parties. The antithesis is between policy, that is politics, plotting, and love. Here again, in little, is the great antithesis of the play. Reason versus emotion, politics versus love, Rome versus Egypt. Key line four. In a series growing more urgent, Antony calls for and addresses his servant, Eros. What, Eros, Eros? Act 4, scene 12, line 30. Unarm, Eros. Act 4, scene 14, line 35. Come, Eros, Eros, line 54. Eros, line 71. Now, Eros, line 93. Having lost the sea battle, and later hearing that Cleopatra is dead, though she is not yet, Antony cries out for his servant Eros, and soon thereafter commands Eros to kill him. Eros kills himself instead. In all this addressing of the servant, Shakespeare must mean us to hear Antony crying out, in equal parts of desire and anguish, as if to erotic love itself. Key line 5. Note Shakespeare's daring irony at Act 5, Scene 2, lines 216 to 222. Cleopatra expresses the fear that if she is captured alive, the quick comedians extemporally will stage us and present our Alexandrian revels. Antony shall be brought drunken forth, and I shall see some squeaking Cleopatra boy my greatness in the posture of a whore. Nay, that's certain. We have seen Antony drunk on liquor, Act 2, Scene 7, with references to the same in at least four other places, as well as on love, and the actor playing Cleopatra in Shakespeare's theater is indeed a boy. It is certain because we have just seen it, confirming that Cleopatra's prophecy reaches far beyond Rome, even though she was not taken there alive. Yet so compelling is the force of the story, the characters, and the poetry that the witty theatrical self-consciousness can only enhance, not interrupt, the drama. Now here are 12 specific notes to help you in your reading. Note 1. In the first speech of the play, Philo, Antony's friend and fellow Roman, expresses disapproval of Antony's dotage on Cleopatra. Note, as I read the speech, how Shakespeare uses the rhetorical devices of alliteration and consonance to incarnate in our audible experience the essential conflict of the play. Specifically, listen to how the plosive sounds of B, T, and P are contrasted with the sibilant P, S, S, T, and S, F sounds to embody the conflict between Rome and Egypt, the Roman B repeatedly driving to the Egyptian S in the very words burst, buckles, and breast, and the Roman T and P dissolving in the SF of strumpet's fool. All of this rhetorical point summed up in the last three words. His captain's heart, which in the scuffles of great fights hath burst the buckles on his breast, reneges all temper and is become the bellows and the fan to cool a gypsy's lust. Take but good note, and you shall see in him the triple pillar of the world transformed into a strumpet's fool. Behold and see. This conflict between plosives and sibilants 
in the very beginning, sets up symbolically and onomatopoetically the thematic conflict of the play. Here, in sound, the Rome that is in Antony is melting not in the Tiber, as Antony imagines a few moments later at line 33, but in the Nile that is Cleopatra. Note 2. Notice the shifts between verse and prose in Act 1, Scene 2. Antony speaks in verse when contemplating the death of his wife Fulvia, lines 122 to 130. When Enobarbus enters to engage in banter about how their leaving Egypt will kill the women, meaning Cleopatra, he and Antony speak in prose, lines 131 to 175. Enobarbus concludes the prose passage with the sexual innuendo about Cleopatra's business depending on Antony's abode, lines 173 to 175. Then Antony, saying no more light answers, meaning frivolous ones, returns to verse, lines 176 to 196. The shifts in tone are thus conveyed not only in the sense of the words, but in the shifts between verse and prose. This is an example of the decorum I discussed in podcast session 5, of chapter 7 in series 1. Note 3. Cleopatra's ha-ha at Act 1, scene 5, line 3, indicates not laughter, but sighing or yawning. Note 4. At Act 2, scene 2, line 44, the word of war means the watchword of the war, the person in whose name it was pursued, as also in his name, that magical word of war, at Act 3, Scene 1, lines 30 to 31. Note 5. At Act 2, Scene 2, lines 48 to 51, Antony asks, Did he not rather discredit my authority with yours, and make the wars alike against my stomach, having alike your cause? This apparently cryptic question may be paraphrased thus. Did he, my brother, not rather bring my authority into discredit along with yours, and make wars against my desire as against yours, I having the same cause as you, meaning the same purposes or aim or matter in hand or grounds for objection. In short, didn't my brother act just as much against me as against you? Note 6. At Act 2, Scene 2, Lines 52 to 54, Antony says, if you'll patch a quarrel, as matter whole you have to make it with, it must not be with this. The antithesis is between patch and matter whole, patching up a quarrel out of bits and pieces versus having a substantial and complete justification for the quarrel. The lines may be paraphrased thus. If you are going to invent a quarrel out of bits and pieces of complaint, you will not be able to use as a sufficiently complete justification, this matter to do it with. This matter referring to Caesar's accusation that Antony's wife and brother made wars against Caesar on Antony's behalf, lines 42 to 44. Note 7. Compare Act 2, Scene 5, lines 1 to 2. Give me some music, music, moody food of us that trade in love with the first line of Twelfth Night. If music be the food of love, play on. Note 8. Compare Act 2, Scene 5, Lines 8 to 9. And when good will is showed, though it come too short, the actor may plead pardon. With Theseus' speech in A Midsummer Night's Dream beginning, For never anything can be amiss when simpleness and duty tender it. Act 5, Scene 1, Lines 82 to 105. Note 9. In Act 2, Scene 6, Lines 71 to 73, Pompey asks, How farest thou, soldier? And Enobarbus answers, Well, and well am like to do, for I perceive four feasts are toward. Here there is a pun on the two senses of fair, F-A-R-E, to get along and to eat. So, how are you doing? I am doing well and I am likely to eat well since there are to be four feasts. Note 10. 
Compare the temptation of Pompey by Minas at Act 2, Scene 7, lines 64 to 73, that is, to kill his guests and thereby rule the world, with Antonio's temptation of Sebastian in The Tempest at Act 2, Scene 1, lines 204 to 294. Note 11. At Act 4, Scene 11, line 1, Caesar says, But being charged, we will be still by land. But means except for, and still means quiet or inactive. We may paraphrase, Unless we are charged at by the opposing army, we will not fight by land. Note 12. At Act 4, Scene 12, lines 25 to 29, Antony says, Oh, this false soul of Egypt, like a right gypsy, at fast and loose beguiled me to the very heart of loss. The word gypsy is a common corruption of Egyptian, and here makes for a pun. Fast and loose is a cheater's betting game, described thus by Sir John Hawkins. A leathern belt is made up into a number of intricate folds and placed edgewise upon a table. One of the folds is made to resemble the middle of the girdle, so that whoever should thrust a skewer into it would think he held it fast to the table, whereas, when he has so done, the person with whom he plays may take hold of both ends and draw it away. Hawkins is quoted in Edmund Malone's 1821 Variorum edition of Shakespeare in volume 12 on page 364. This commonplace phrase for cheating, playing fast and loose, also appears in Love's Labour's Lost, Act 1, Scene 2, Lines 155 to 157, and Act 3, Scene 1, Line 103, and in King John, Act 3, Scene 1, Line 242. I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare.